What's up? It's Phil from Fit Will Expose, and today's episode we have an extremely special guest who goes by the name of John Metals. This guy doesn't need any introduction. I've been talking about him in countless amounts of videos I've had in the past. Whenever I mention rear delt swings, whenever I mention Metals rows, and he's been a huge inspiration to me. And he's hands down one of my favorite bodybuilders of all time because of his discipline, his uh, curiosity, his unconventional methods. And not just being unconventional just to be different, but also because he's tried a lot of stuff in the past and there's been certain things that haven't worked for him. And he's just a very intuitive guy and he's just always looking for new ways to uh, better himself. So, welcome aboard. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge, uh, you're a huge inspiration to me and a lot of, uh, a lot of my subscribers. So, uh, yeah, very happy to have you here. So... It's going to be a blitz Q&A. The whole theme is going to be back training, delt training, and a bit of tricep and brachialis. And okay. I remember I was reading, I found out about you in about uh, maybe 2012. And uh, that's where I got the rear delt swing from, uh, you know, the Meadows row. And I get a lot of my, my philosophies when it comes to back and delt training from you. And I remember you even saying so yourself that you didn't have the best... Uh, Del genetics, you didn't have the best back genetics, and you tried like the typical advice that everybody gives you, and it didn't work for you. And I really respect that because in the fitness community that we're in today, a lot of people say, Oh, deadlift's the only answer, you know, just like barbell row and just the typical stuff, you know, like standing military press, and like that stuff is great, but it doesn't necessarily work for everybody, you know. And you were still getting results off it, but. It's just the other stuff, like the small tweaks you were making, like, you know, uh, the slight incline presses, um, just the slight tweaks, you know, the pullovers where you have your head off the bench, um, the partial, like, laterals, the partial rear delt work, uh, doing, your, doing a lot of your rolls with, like, a landmine, doing, like, your rack pulls, like, from below the kneecap as opposed to always just pulling from the floor, like everybody's saying. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> So first things first, let's start with back, all right? Yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, so um, let's talk about the Meadows row. Um, how did you come up with this lift? <laughs> well, it's not a very exciting story. I was in the gym, and I was walking by a T-bar row, and I bent over to grab it and actually just to stretch my lat. And um, I was like, wow, this feels pretty good. And I, I rode it, and I thought, man, it actually feels pretty good to row it. And so I started tinkering around with it, and um, I was like, man, this is a really good row. It's a great variation. I wasn't having a whole lot of success with the regular bar barbell rows. Um, I felt like it was primarily uh, a lower back isometric exercise and some rear delts and maybe some traps. But uh, in order for me to really fill it in my lats, I had to really um, lighten the weight quite a bit and, you know, if you weight, lighten the weight too much, you don't have enough tension to even stress the muscle. So I just never felt um, the great results that everybody else claimed that they had from the barbell row. And that seemed like a really good alternative. So I, I stuck with it and I kept doing those. And I was like, wow, man, these actually are working really well. So they became kind of a staple in my workouts. Yeah. So yeah. for the viewers watching, you don't know what the medals row is. It's basically... It's like a, you go uh, sideways to a landmine, you just roll like that. So it's pretty much like a dumbbell roll, but using a landmine instead. And it's a great Yeah, the tension, is, the tension is different, and you can uh, look on my YouTube. Mountain Dog 1 is my YouTube, and I have several, um, several videos of it, too. There's a couple different ways you can do it, but I have all kinds of videos on it, so, so if anybody wants to check it out. So I was watching one of your videos with, I think it was Mark, Mark Lobiner, and I saw you doing like a rack pull from right above the kneecap where your arms are slightly bent and you're just kind of like locking it out. Yeah, there's a couple of different ways. I, 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 li I like rack, rack pulls a lot and I generally like to pull from about mid shin. I feel like mid shin is about the lowest I can get and keep the stress on the lower lats and the back. I find that if I go off the floor, there's a lot of um, other muscles that come into play, but to really feel it in my lats, which is why I do um, rack pulls. I think and 
Typically, if you say I have bent arms, I'll probably pull my elbows back and really squeeze in my lats. Um, because I do do those every once in a while. It's just a nice little way to load your lats. It's almost, it's, it's more of like an isometric contraction, really. Mm -hmm. um, people don't really think about the three different types of muscle contractions. You know, there's concentric, eccentric, but there's also isometric contractions. And if you do a really good hard isometric contraction, it's actually a harder contraction than a concentric or eccentric contraction. They're actually really cool to kind of sprinkle into your workouts. And that's kind of a variation of it. Yeah. Like, not long ago, I was with some, uh, this like Russian, like slash like Bulgarian coach that I see every now and then. And I, I, was, I wanted him to teach me how to do the rack pull below the kneecap in the way that you're doing it. In the video where you superset it with the chins. I showed him that video and he's like, that's the most flawless form I've ever seen. So you mind telling the viewers, how do you initiate the movement like with with more lats? Because you know, a lot of people, they do the, the rack pull below the kneecap or even like really close to mid shin, but they feel a lot in the low back and they're not really like maximizing the upper back and lat involvement. Well, I think most people think of it as a move the bar from point A to point B. And it's an exercise that you can really load up a lot of weight. So people, they, you know, they like to load up six plates, seven plates, eight plates, but it's more of a spinal erector exercise when you do it that way. The way I do them, I can't do them quite as heavy, but what I do is I actually flex my lats before I even start the movement. So, you know, I'll grab the bar and I'll actually flex my lats all the way down to my lower lat. And that's how I initiate the movement. I flex my lats and I contract them and that's how I start the bar moving as opposed to just driving my feet through the floor and trying to pull the, pull the bar up. Well, are you doing anything? Where you're, are you trying to like actively bend the bar or like pull the bar to you like a pullover or are you just flexing the lats and just coming up? What I like to do <coughs> is I like to keep the bar in really close, um, right right on my legs, right on my thighs. And I flex my lats, and I literally just drag the bar up my thigh, and I'm flexing my lats the whole time. Um, in my mind, I'm just thinking, keep your lats tight, keep your lats tight. When I lose that tension, I'm either just fatigued or I've went too heavy. So I like to do them uh, as heavy as I can, but still feel that really hard contraction while I'm doing them. Okay, let's talk about, um, I, wa I, l I looked at your video or your article where you're talking about your top three favorite rows and surprisingly enough you had the Smith machine row in there. I don't know if you're, you still agree with that but you mind elaborating on that? Like, Do you just feel like better uh, contraction or you get better squeezes with that? or 100% better than our barbell row. Those feel a million times better and I set the bar up actually kind of like mid-shin. It's almost like I'm setting it up like I'm going to do a, a rack pull. But I, um, what I do is I keep my back flat and I keep my hands in um, pretty close. I don't go too wide. If I'm going real wide, I, I, I don't quite get the range of motion. But in my head, what I'm thinking about is drive your elbows up and flex your back while you're doing it. And I find with the Smith machine, I'm nice and stable. It doesn't feel like a bar barbell row to me. It feels different. Mm -hmm. So I can use a fair amount of weight. And again, what I'm thinking about is, okay, drive my elbows up toward the ceiling and flex my whole back. I don't really feel it in any one part of my back. I actually feel it all over. I feel it in my lats, my rhomboids, my traps. Mm -hmm. I feel it all over. It's a, it's a great exercise. But for me, the key is... It's not going real wide. It's going kind of medium and really driving your elbows up and flexing your whole back, trying to keep the tension in that. I also like to do those with kind of dead stop form. You know, like you set the bar down each rep and then mm -hmm. bam, drive your elbows up and then set the bar down for a split second and bam, do it again. Mm -hmm. I like to do those with a little bit of explosive cadence, which is, you know, that kind of tempo is not normal in a row. But I find with the Smith machine allows me to use a little bit of an a, an explosive tempo, and I actually really like that. It feels great doing it that way. Okay, so two more questions for back. So I noticed you do your pullovers with um, your head right off the bench, which is very, which is very interesting because I was actually making a couple pullover videos. I was talking about the regular version, like the Ronnie version, and then I pretty much changed my mind after like two weeks. I'm like, okay, I like the decline bench better. And then I watched your video. I'm like, wow, just a simple act of just putting your head off the bench you feel like a way better stretch and yeah you feel like great constant tension throughout the whole range of motion you know like if you bring it to like your forehead or whatever but do you still think that's the best like is that still your favorite pullover variation up to date yeah yeah i love those i love the range of motion the extra range of motion that you get and i don't know if you've seen but 
I also like incorporating bands every once in a while when I do those. Yeah. Um, you know, normally with a dumbbell uh, pullover, you feel a lot of tension in the stretch position. And if you notice, I only pull up to my forehead. The reason why I do that is if you continue to go past your forehead, the tension kind of shifts off your lats and can kind of go in your chest and other areas where you don't necessarily want it if you're trying to work your back. But what I found is um, playing with that band, um, I have the band around the dumbbell and uh, have somebody stand behind me and actually put the band around their leg. You get an unbelievable amount of tension. Normally when you get kind of to the top, the tension lets up. But if you use a band and you're actually push, you're actually pulling against the band. Yeah. Um, you get an unbelievable amount of tension. And everybody that I've had try that, they were like, "Oh my God, I had no idea that a pullover could could feel that good." So that's something that I try to encourage people to try. Is every once in a while when you're doing those, use a band and do them like that, and you'll just feel an unbelievable amount of tension. Okay, so let's talk the the medals row and the the one arm T bar, like one arm landmine row. So obviously you invented the medals row. And I'm pretty sure you see like people worldwide, you know, bastardizing this movement. It's, it's such a great exercise, and like I actually prefer it compared to like the dumbbell row. I feel like a way better stretch. I feel a way better squeeze, and I just because you're pulling off a, a very specific angle, you know. Yeah. yeah. And um, you mind just telling like me and obviously the viewers too, what are like the biggest like no nos, biggest mistakes people make when? Uh, and I know you mentioned have the the hip higher. But like, yeah, the side you're with. yeah, I would say the biggest problem people have is they rotate their torso when they do it. So when I'm lowering the bar and I want to stretch, what a lot of times people do is they'll, they'll twist their torso with it and they kind of turn into a waist exercise. It kind of turns into obliques. They even start the movement by twisting their waist. And what I try to get people to do is square your shoulders up. And, and as you mentioned, the side that you're lifting on, pop that hip up just a little so you can really reach and stretch. Um, that's probably the biggest thing I see people uh, mess up on. And I see it not just with that exercise. You'll see people do it with dumbbell rows. You'll see people doing a dumbbell row, and they'll reach down. And you can tell they're trying to stretch, but they twist their waist. Mm -hmm. And you really aren't getting any stretch on your lat when you do that. And then again, they start the row by twisting. So it's almost like a waist exercise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so let's let's move on to delts now. This is this is really what I wanted to talk to you about, because uh, for all of you guys who don't know, and John Meadows even admitted him that this himself, he had the worst delt genetics. You know, uh, thick neck, huge legs, narrow clavicles, and like these are the kinds of guys that you have to listen to if you really want to bring up your delts, because he really had to build his delts from the ground up. He had to try different methods, different compound lifts, different isolation lifts, the whole nine yards. You know, and uh, when I talk about rear delts. A lot of my philosophies actually come from John Meadows, so we're really getting it like we're really getting down to the roots here. So let's talk about the rear delt swing. So you talked about this exercise like very long ago. I want to still know if you if you're like um, if you still live by the same uh, philosophies up to this day. Like, uh, do you like to do the first off when you do the rear delt swing on the incline bench? Uh, do you like to do it with constant tension? Because you see guys who like they touch the dumbbells. You see guys who like they leave a big space. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, I don't always do them on an incline. Sometimes I just bend over and do them. But the reason why I call them swings, and for those of you who are listening, you may not know what we mean, I literally let my arms hang straight, and I don't flex my traps. I don't turn it into a row. I think in terms of tech, the, in terms of executing the movement, a lot of people will turn into a rhomboid and a trap exercise and will start doing a row, whereas I'm just letting my arm hang. I'm just pivoting with my rear delt. There's literally no other muscle that's doing the movement except the rear delt. Um, now, in terms of range of motion, it is a little shorter, you know, because you're not reaching across your body. But still, you can load your rear delts hard, and you can get some awesome rear delts just from doing these swings. The nice thing about the swings is what I typically do with people is I'll have them uh, use a little bit heavier weight than normal. Um, and then as they fatigue, I have them just do partial reps. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. There's another phone ringing here. Let me see if I can shut this off. Call from Joe. So um, one of the keys, so when you're doing these, these bent over um, hanging swings, one of the keys is 
in order to keep tension in your rear delt, what we do is we maybe start a little heavier. But as you can't get the weight all the way up, we just shorten our range of motion. And the nice thing there is you can use a little heavier weight. You can load the rear delt with some weight, but you can get a lot of reps. You know, maybe you can only do six to ten reps with a full range of motion, but then you can only come up halfway. Maybe you knock out another six to ten reps like that. Then maybe you're only moving the weight six inches. But even with that little bit of range of motion, if you've done these, you know what I mean, they still burn like fire. The rear delt is still contracting mm. to move the weight. So, you know, I do these sets of 20, 25, 30 reps, um, but it really the tension is locked right in there on the rear delt. Um, so those are those are still my favorites. You know, one of the things I've, I've been playing around with is um, one day I was goofing off, uh, which is what happens with a lot of my movements, I figure out. But I grabbed a couple 10-pound plates, and I... I did a rear. I bent over and did some rear delt swings by crossing my arms, and um, and then I used a 25 pound place and I held them in my hand and I started doing like that. That's kind of a cool little exercise. Try that. Try that next time you go to a gym. Just grab some tens, put them in your hands, and reach. And you're doing your rear delt, so you're bent over. Mm. But you can reach and you can actually stretch a lot more on your rear delt doing that. But I've been kind of playing around with that lately. It's a pretty cool movement. I haven't seen anybody else doing it. Yeah. But um, when well, you get to the gym, man, try those. I'll definitely give it a shot, but I actually made a video um, called my top five favorite swing variations, and there's actually one I think you'd like a lot. It's, you grab like a, those mini bands, you know, they're like the, the very small ones, they're like circular, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you yeah. put it around your wrist. You do rear delt swings with it. You grab dumbbells, you do it like that, so you're getting extra tension. And I, I've seen it like that one a lot because even when you're, it's like you're getting constant tension from the band, but you're also using like... You also have dumbbells yeah. in your hands too, you know. That sounds really hard. <laughs> yeah, it's, but like, um, I'll definitely give your your, your variation a try with the, the, the ten pound plates, you know. Yeah. But um, but moving on, this is what I really want to know. It's you always talk about the rear delt swing for rear delts, and what's your current philosophies on the lateral delts? Like, what's your like? Give me your like your top three favorite lateral raise variations. Is there any like partial swing, like lateral raise, or like? Uh... Yeah, we do. Yeah, well, a lot of times what we do is I originally started doing sets of sixty like this. Now I do like sets of twenty or thirty, but we'll grab a heavy dumbbell and we'll just do partials with it. The, again, again, you're letting your arm hang straight, and you're coming out to the side. A lot of people when they do their side delts, they start bringing their hands out in front of them and they turn into a front delt exercise. But we grab, you know, fifty pound dumbbells. We put them right against our sides, and we'll just sit there and do little partials like that. And then sometimes what we do is when we're fatigued, well, then we'll grab, like, 20-pound dumbbells, and we'll work the top range of motion. Um, but I think, like, for side delts, I mean, I just like the classic side side lateral raise. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But I think the biggest thing I think people do, I see people doing, is, like, start getting their arms out in front. Mm -hmm. But you got to keep your arms to your side and come straight out to the side. Now, it's a lot harder that way. You can't use as much weight. But you can really load your side delt and not so much your front delt. When, when you say the one the variation you just talked about before, so let me get this straight. I'm seated on a bench or something. My torso is a little bit lean forward. and Am I kind of making the dumbbells almost touch by going under my legs? And then I'm just yeah, doing like a partial? Yeah, okay. you can do it that way. Yeah. Okay, and you could go pretty heavy on that. Like you're, you're saying like 50 pounds a hand. Or yeah, start or... heavy, and then when you when it gets too heavy to keep good form, then just light. Then just grab like a pair of 20 pound dumbbells and keep going. It it burns like fire. Okay, interesting. What about um? Is there another variation you recommend, or like another good one? Oh uh, man, I like side laterals. I mean, I don't really do much else for my for my uh, the medial head of my delts. Um, I do some press in here and there. But I don't do a lot of real heavy pressing over my head. Mm. I tend to I I tend to do a lot of incline pressing for my chest. As long as I'm doing that, my shoulders will stay nice and thick. But if I start doing real heavy overhead pressing, it never never fails, man. I start getting a lot of shoulder pain and a rotator cuff gets real tight and it starts aching. It's just uh, I can get away with doing them like once every month or two. But if mm. I do it any more than that, it just the risk isn't worth the reward for me personally. Because that was my next question, was onto the presses. So let's say in an ideal world, if you were to have no shoulder problems and you could press overhead pain-free, what do you think? Everybody has a different like philosophy. Some people say oh, you have to push press. Some people, I understand that like every press has its place in the program, but like if you were to really say like, hey, this is the this is the one you really want to focus on. Would you say something like uh, the seated barbell military press? You know what I like doing is. 
I like getting in a Smith machine, and I like doing, um, I guess you would call it an overhead press. It's like a really high incline, though. So I take the bar, and I get all the way down. I can almost even feel it in my chest, and I come up with them. Um, I call those a high incline Smith press. It's so high, it's mostly shoulder, though. So, you know, <clears throat> your, your angle is only probably about that much. Normal inclines here. And you come mm. up, so it's just a slight angle. I actually love doing those for uh, shoulders. Mm -hmm. What about, um, okay, so we just discussed rear. Let's talk about the front. Is there like a front raise variation that you use for people who have like very lagging front delts? Where it's kind of like the swing equivalent for the front delt? Or? Yeah, I mean, I like the good old where you grab a 45 and you, you pull it out in front of you. You know, those are very good for mm. isolation. Um, another thing I do is um, sometimes I'll hook a band up and I'll do a front raise holding the band, but what I do is I step forward. So if you can picture, there's a really good stretch on my front delt. Normally, you're only starting from a seated position. You're only coming up right here. But if you can picture like a band and like I'm real far forward, you're putting your shoulder in a position to stretch. So you get some extra range of motion that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so just like hook a, a red band, like a uh, like a a mini band or a monster mini band. If you just hook it to a rack or something, grab it in your hands, and then just walk forward until your arms are stretched. That's and it's pretty. It's safe too. It's not going to tear your shoulders up. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I want to move on to arms now, but I, I want to just rewind it back a bit. I remember you were talking about um, kettlebell rows. You mind just elaborating on that? Oh, yeah, I was just goofing off one day, man. I did some kettlebell rows for my back, and it feels awesome. It's a it's a different kind of tension. Um, it's one of those things where I have a really hard time explaining it. You just got to try it. But I basically use a, um, a pronated hand position, so I'm not neutral. I'm pronated, and I just I literally just bend over and do rows with them. But there's something about those kettlebells. Maybe it's that you can get them up higher because the dumbbell's wider. Right, but just just try those, man. It's a, a really good variation. Yeah, I, I tried it last night. I tried a bunch of lifts that like I've never tried, like the partial pull down, the Smith row, uh, the lat the lat pullover, and like I'm I'm liking a lot of these lifts. And what I'm noticing with the kettlebell row is that it's kind of like since there's a ball right under the handle, I feel like I get like a better stretch. I don't know what it is. I I probably have to like play around with it a bit more, but I think there's yeah, something to it, you know. There's just something to that tension, man. I don't even know how to explain it, but I just tell people, look, man, just try it. Mm -hmm. And when people try it, they're like, I see what you mean. You like feel this tension that doesn't go away. It's it's really it's really good. Okay, so let, let's talk about now uh, my two favorite arm muscles, the tricep long head and the brachialis. So just like how you said you don't have the best uh, the delt genetics, I'm the complete opposite. I have great delt genetics, but my arms are like piss poor, like, poverty, like, uh, mind-muscle connection, like, they don't fire easily, the attachments suck, but you actually, out of all the, all the, all the advice I got on the internet for bicep training and forearm training, you probably gave me, like, the best one, it's to say, when you said, um, train the brachialis first, you know, because you always hear people saying, you know, do your heavy barbell curls first, or your heavy cheek curls first, or just a heavy supinated curl first, and your philosophy is, like, the brachialis, that's really what's going to make the arm look big, too, you know? And if you put yeah, more emphasis more, on that, like... Yeah, the more that muscle develops, the more it pushes out your body and your drive. Your, yeah, it makes your arm look really wide and stuff, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, and I've noticed, too, like, you, you like the... Um, once again, with the angles, like, the unique angles, you like the cross-arm hammer curl, which is a phenomenal lift. But well, what are some common mistakes that you see with people uh, when it comes to brachialis training? Because I know if you look at guys like Christian Thibodeau, He's saying how brachialis, and a lot of other coaches too, will say that brachialis responds well to like very slow tempos, like hard squeezes. But like, yeah. what's your take? I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I think the biggest problem people have is they try to go so heavy, they just swing the weight. And it turns into not so much a brachialis, but your brachioradialis, right? So the top mm -hmm. of your forearm, um, people try to do those so heavy, it turns into more of almost a forearm exercise. But I do like the slow tempos on the squeezing on brachialis. I do feel like that that gives you your best bang for your buck. Okay. What about um, what's on like the tricep? Let's just talk about the triceps in general, right? 
What do you tell a guy who can't really feel, which is actually me and also a couple of my subscribers, who can't really feel close grip presses no matter what they do? Like they use bands, they use chains, they do it off a board, uh, they do like a no lockout, they do like no, don't touch the chest. They did do different like flares with the elbows. Well, have you, um, okay, so I would start with a pull, a pull down, okay? Or a press down, whatever you call it, push down. Um, but have you ever seen me do them with the single handles? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. If you just try those with the handles, you'll be amazed at how much better you feel those in your triceps. Um, I put my hands together with those single handles, and I let my elbows ride up so it's stretching the medial head and that uh, long head, and just drive the weight straight down, not back like a lat exercise, but... If you if you tinker around on my uh, YouTube and you see like in particular some of the arm workouts I've done lately, I've been using for probably about a year now. I've been using them single handles so that can move, mm. and the feeling I get on my triceps is a million times better than I used to feel. Okay. Okay, I've got like two more questions left, and we'll wrap it up. So let's talk like the tricep long head, right? With the with the overhead extension, like using yep. an easy bar, using a dumbbell. What do you tell someone who can't really feel it, and what do you feel like are some common mistakes people make with overhead extensions in general? I think doing them first because it beats your elbows up. What I would rather someone do is a lot of push downs, get their triceps full of blood, and then do the stretching once they're full of blood and your elbows are warmed up. But I see people going straight into those heavy dumbbells, and all they do is just tear their elbows up. But And I actually like ropes too. So if you get somebody to spot you and they hand you a rope, then you can do the rope stretches, and when you get to here, you know, pull your elbow back and really stretch that long head. That makes a pretty big difference too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So last question of the day, then we'll pretty much wrap it up. It's not not even related to any body part, but um, as far as I'm concerned, from what I've read, you're a, you're a big advocate of uh, intra delta workout charge, right? Yeah. Do you mind just explaining, because a lot of people don't know what, uh, what this is. Do you mind just explaining the benefits of intra-delta workout charge? Um, are you talking about the intra-workout drinks? Yeah. Okay, well, it's hard to bring it, break it down real simple, but here's, here's what I would tell you. Um, when you supply easily absorbable amino acids and carbohydrates while you train, they um, can really minimize the muscle protein breakdown that happens. So <clears throat> you have muscle protein synthesis, which is building up, and you have muscle protein breakdown, which is what happens while you train, it's tearing down the muscle. And you need to tear it down um, so it can build back and it can repair and be better. But you don't need, you know how people train, they're so sore, they're like crippled the next day. You don't need to be that sore. Like you need to minimize muscle protein breakdown. And when you use the really absorbable amino acids and carbohydrates while you train, it greatly helps your recovery. And what you notice is you don't get nearly as sore. And the benefit there is that you can train more often, so you have more opportunities to grow. So instead of training a body part once a week, then all of a sudden you can train it twice a week. And if you look at that over the long haul, because really that's what bodybuilding is about, it's about the long haul. And if you look at, if you think about that, doing double the amount of workouts, assuming they're quality workouts, you can make progress a lot faster. And, you know, you said you started listening to me in 2012. And 2012 is when I really started focusing on this. And I made huge progress. Probably the biggest progress I made other than 1999 was 2012. And it was direct, directly because of the recovery I had from the nutrition. Mm hmm but you think uh, it helps like pumps and like uh, and just energy as a whole for your workout? Well, when you get deep into a workout, it can help because you're supplying more carbohydrates that can be used for energy. Um, I don't think it's something where you get a ton of energy at the beginning of your workout. I just think it enables you to train with a little more volume. And mm -hmm. volume uh, is, is a big factor in whether you're going to gain muscle or not. Um, volume can help build muscle. Um, and then the other thing is pumps. It kind of depends on your diet. Like if you have a good diet and you're consuming carbohydrates, you should get a good pump. So I don't look at it so much as something that will aid your pumps. I look at it as something that will aid your recovery, if that makes sense. Mm. Okay. So 
that pretty much wraps it up. I really uh, I thank you a lot for being on this channel today, taking the time out your day to, you know, uh, to all the viewers watching, you guys need to do me a huge favor. Subscribe to John Mills' channel. I'm going to put the link in the description box. And the guy um, uploads at a very high frequency. So he's like pretty much posting every single day. You can learn a bunch of stuff from him. And he's pretty much one of the most knowledgeable guys in the fitness industry. He doesn't get more knowledgeable than this. So. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Well, thanks a lot, it. man. I appreciate it. You, you betcha. Take care. Take care.